Take my bride, let's go for a ride in my new fangled automobile. Just where we will go, nobody knows, but it's sure a great way to feel. Behind the wheel of the speed me to steal, it's my new fangled automobile. Hello and welcome to Vintage Car History. I'm Wild Bill. People that invent things typically have one thing in common. They enjoy the inventing process, and when their invention is completed, and especially if it actually works, they're thrilled and excited in the moment. Unfortunately, sometimes a new invention, even one that is unlike anything else out there, can actually be illegal in whole or part from the moment it was made, or sometimes people will see it and then decide to write laws to make it illegal. When either of these situations happen, it's quite the buzzkill for the inventor, and early automotive history is full of such frustration. So, let's take a brief look at early cars and the law. Black's Law Dictionary defines the term automobile as follows. A vehicle for the transportation of persons or property on the highway, carrying its own motive power and not operated upon fixed tracks. This definition dates back to 1891 and is based on case law in both the U.S. and Europe going back as far as a hundred years prior. The challenge with this definition is that under it all cars are automobiles. But not all automobiles are cars. Cars are personal vehicles and can be operated by one person, be they gas-powered, steam, electric, or whatever. Yet there are plenty of things found on roads, big rigs, farm vehicles, mobile cranes, and other such, that are motor vehicles or automobiles, as the dictionary states, but are obviously not cars. Cars as we understand them today first appeared in Europe in the mid-1880s, but motor vehicles, or automobiles, as the various national laws around the world understood the term, had been around for decades longer. By the 1820s, railroads competed with road-going steam tractors and coaches all across Europe for commercial dominance, and the nations began to enact laws to regulate these vehicles in one way or another. Because of this, many of the first cars to be built in a country or imported into it found themselves restrained under laws meant for big commercial steam vehicles. Most of the laws didn't recognize the difference between a 25-ton traction engine and a 500-pound Benz patent motor wagon. Perhaps the most famous of such anti-automobile laws were spawned in the United Kingdom in the form of the various locomotive acts, also known as Red Flag Acts, during the mid-19th century. When automobiles were first built or imported into England, these laws, which had already been on the books for decades, limited all cars to 4 miles per hour on the highway and 2 miles per hour in town. Additionally, the driver had to be accompanied by both a bell ringer to walk beside the car to herald its passing, as well as a flagman walking some 50 feet ahead of it, waving his flag to warn of the impending danger on both highway and city roads. True, this sounds pretty laughable today, but at that time, and thus in the proper context, these acts did make sense. The British Empire of the 19th century was the largest, wealthiest, most industrially powerful and technologically advanced empire that the world had ever seen. The Industrial Revolution and thus the modern world began there, and therefore it was in Britain that the very first laws to deal with modern first world problems were written. One of the many questions that the Industrial Revolution caused was how to share the road with machines. It came up early and it wasn't a simple answer. Richard Trevithick invented both the locomotive and a practical road-going steam coach on or around 1801 in Cornwall. By the 1820s, engineers and ironmongers across Britain were building both locomotives and steam coaches in the hopes of striking it rich with the new technology. There were advantages and disadvantages to both technologies. The locomotives were supported by special built roads with iron rails. These roads could carry a lot of weight with little maintenance, and thus trains could transport large amounts of people or cargo. On the downside, you need to build the railroad tracks, and those can be quite expensive. Steam coaches could operate on most of the existing roads throughout the empire, and so there was no need to add the expense of making special railways. Just about all of Britain was already accessible to a steam coach. 
However, these roads were not designed to be used by vehicles pulling multiple wagons or trailers behind them. They wouldn't be able to make the turns. This limited the overall length and thus weight that road-going motor vehicles could carry, which reduced their efficiency and thus profitability. Let's not forget the third player in the world of 19th century British transportation industry, the canal system. England had been crisscrossed by various waterways, both natural and man-made, and sometimes uh, both, since the Middle Ages. Various companies owned the boats, barges, and sometimes the canals themselves, moving large cargoes and sometimes passengers around about. However, the Industrial Revolution, and with it the demand for coal, caused a massive boom to the canal transport business since they could move large amounts of coal with ease. And for the canal companies, all was well until locomotives showed up. Trains could move as much coal as they could and take the coal to locations that digging a canal to reach would either be too cost prohibitive or simply impossible. Needless to say, the 1830s saw all three of these groups throwing rocks at each other trying to gain the upper hand financially, politically, and socially. The canal people said that the trains were noisy, messy, and killed livestock as they passed by. The steamcoach tribe mocked trains and barges for being so limited in where they can go, and train tycoons pointed out that the coaches damaged the roads and were themselves unsafe, which was actually only partially correct. Steamcoaches were not particularly damaging to the roads of the time due to having very wide steel wheels. However, steering and braking were not well developed at the time, so accidents, sometimes fatal, did occur. The Victorian era began in 1837, and this monarch reigned over one quarter of the population of the world. From the beginning of her reign, she demonstrated a particular countenance, and much of her own personality was reflected in the lawmaking of the time. And the Queen did have her own opinion regarding the whole issue. She did not act upon it at first, rather she patiently watched for over 20 years as these three industries did battle in business, technology, and of course Parliament. Throughout the 1840s and 50s, the canal saw decline, the steam coaches made a bit of headway, while the railroads exploded with growth. By the early 1860s, railroads had grown across Britain, and even subways were being built or planned. Meanwhile, steam coaches were able to reach rural areas that trains did not, but were charged a toll by the Crown for the privilege of using the road to cover the road maintenance. Of course, coaches still needed to attract customers, and so one of the things that they did was become much faster, being able to reach these places, these rural areas, at speeds of 20, 25, and even 30 miles an hour and more. But these tolls kept getting higher and higher until, by the 1860s, the steam coaches could not compete against the trains when it came to the price for fares. The cost of the tolls was passed to the customer, and when the customer stopped riding, the coaches stopped running. This is when the Queen asserted her opinion quietly into the fray. Steam coaches were, in her opinion, smelly, unsightly, noisy. Uh, note that steam engines themselves are very quiet, but the sound of large steel wheels crushing gravel, giant exposed gears clanking, and other such can be quite a racket, and were definitely unsafe. With railroads, only the trains used them. The canals are for boats, but roads are for people on foot, horses, wagons, push carts, small herds, and in Her Majesty's opinion, steam vehicles on her roads were a menace. Even though she was queen, she couldn't just simply outlaw steam coaches with a word. Her suggestion was a simple solution. The passenger steam coaches make their money by being faster than a horse or even a train, which is one of the things that made them so darn dangerous. If we simply limit their speed to a walking pace, this will render them useless as passenger vehicles, while at the same time not completely disable their usefulness in industrial or agricultural needs where speed is not crucial. Parliament passed the first Locomotive Act in 1861. It not only raised the tolls quite considerably, but lowered the speed limit to 10 miles an hour on the highway and 5 in the city limits. But this was not enough in Victoria's mind, and thus the Locomotive Act of 1865, the Red Flag Act, was passed. This limited the speed to 4 miles per hour on the open road and 2 miles per hour in town, as well as the requirements of lights on the vehicle, the bell ringer, the flagman, and so on. And as predicted, passenger steamcoach service ceased to exist in England, yet traction engines hauling very heavy loads to and from mines and farms at slow, safe speeds carried on, being led by their flagmen. 
Now let's move forward to the year 1889. Stop and think. What would it have been like to live in Britain at that time? Let's say you're a wealthy British businessman or nobleman. You recently returned from the 1889 Paris World's Fair and saw the cars on display there. Benzes, Daimlers, Didion Boutons, and Peugeots. You ordered one, and in the early summer of 1890, it arrives in Liverpool and is unloaded from the cargo ship. The obvious thing to do would be to greet the car at the docks, fuel it up, and drive it home. And you wouldn't give that idea a second thought. After all, the only motor vehicles on English roads are huge, slow steam machines hauling tons of stuff with flagmen ahead of them. And it had been like that for decades. And obviously, this new car is not a big commercial monster machine, and so that law would not apply. And you turned out to be wrong. On the way home, a policeman flags you down and cites you for violating the Red Flag Act by both speeding and not having a flagman. Of course, this is something you're going to go to court and contest, and the argument is clear. This car is not the kind of motor vehicle that the law addressed, and the judge makes his ruling. The letter of the law is clear. The machine you bought is a vehicle, it has its own motive power, and does not use rails. It's an automobile under the law, and you will pay the fine or see jail time. And you begrudgingly pay the fine, get a flagman to get the car home, park it, and start sulking. Yes, to the British automobile enthusiasts of the day, that law seemed hopelessly outdated and needed to be dealt with if the British automobile industry was to thrive. There were two main obstacles before the early English petrol heads. First was that the general public as a whole were not particularly warm to cars. Second was that the driving force behind that public attitude was Queen Victoria herself. To deal with the first problem, the British Auto Club, or later the REC, was formed to promote car events across England, and men like Frederick Sims, Harry Lawson, Claude Johnson, and Frederick Lanchester, to name a few, lobbied both the public and the Parliament to soften their hearts towards automobiles. Meanwhile, the auto industry around the world as a whole set to work to change the heart of the Queen. The idea was this. Queen Victoria absolutely hated cars just as she did steam coaches. So, if someone somewhere in the world was able to make a car that she liked, it would be like winning the World Cup and an Oscar on the same day. An unbelievable feat. So, Across the globe, manufacturers set to design a car that she would specifically like. Many of these firms even named their cars Victoria. Some even went so far as to establish entirely new car manufacturing firms under the name Victoria. Indeed, more makes and models of cars were named after her than any other person in history. Unfortunately, she never did pick a car she liked, nor accept one as a gift, or own one, or drive one, or even ride in one, until the day she died. Yet she did eventually relent, much in part due to the persistent work of Harry Lawson. Harry was, of course, a major player in the British automotive industry, shackled by the Red Flag Act, though it was, and he was also a professional acquaintance of Edward, Prince of Wales. The two of them socialized occasionally, and it was through this that Edward became interested in cars, eventually becoming a petrol head in his own right. Harry encouraged the prince to work on his mom to find a reason for her to let cars be used in the empire as they were meant to be used. And the reason eventually was money. If Britain could develop a world-class automotive industry, the whole nation would profit. It took six years of arguing with the government and the queen before a solution was at hand. As late as October 23, 1896, a citation was issued to a driver for not having a flagman. But within days of this, the act was amended, and automobiles no longer needed a flagman, and the speed limits were raised nationally to a more modern 15 miles an hour. This may seem slow, but in 1896, it was the typical cruising speed of a car. Outside of Great Britain, countries such as Germany, France, the USA, Belgium, and Spain did not initially make any sweeping national legislation regarding cars, but rather left their fate to the local governments. There were some small towns in the USA during the 1890s and early 1900s that, upon hearing of the existence of cars, or possibly of an accident involving one, banned them from their streets. 
Many of these U.S. bans only lasted a few years and did not have much impact on the automotive development in the U.S. Many towns in Germany outlawed the driving of cars on Sundays. Switzerland did as well and continued to do so well into World War I. Speaking of the Swiss, they did not initially react well to cars. They began to write laws heavily restricting their use. Their attitude was justifiable. Swiss roads could not handle the car traffic. I mean, to be fair, they could barely handle foot traffic in some places. They were narrow, very windy, steep, dangerous, and difficult to maintain. Adding cars to this mix was, in the mind of the great yodelers, asking for many accidents to happen. So public opinion was against cars from the beginning, and so for the few Swiss car enthusiasts out there, it was better to just go elsewhere to pursue cars. You can ask Mark Burgett how well that worked out. Not long after auto racing began, the Swiss wrote local laws against either racing or cars entirely or both. By 1899, car racing was banned nationally in Switzerland, and more than half of all Swiss towns banned cars either partially or completely from their roads. The most famous car ban to come from Switzerland, or any other country for that matter, was the ban placed by the Canton of Grissens in southeast Switzerland. Cantons are to the Swiss what states are to Americans. The U.S. has 50 and the Swiss have 26, Grissom being their largest. In 1900, they decided that their roads will never be suitable for cars and banned them outright throughout the entire Canton. And this total ban on cars remained in place until 1925. For an American, this would be kind of like the state of Hawaii banning all cars from all roads throughout the state, both public and private, for the next 25 years. Unthinkable, yet it happened in Switzerland. Yet all of the anti-car examples we've talked about thus far do not compare with the complete cultural and legal abstinence of all things automotive than that which was found in the late 19th and early 20th century Japan. It may seem ironic that a nation which today is one of, if not the largest producers of cars in the world, and yet the idea of even using a car was taboo a mere 120 years ago. Here's a basic background. For many centuries, Japan has had very specific laws regarding the use of wheeled vehicles on their roads. They were allowed to be used at any time on the roads and could be pulled by men or horses. Additionally, they could carry whatever cargo you wished, except a person. It was illegal in Japan to ride in a wheeled vehicle. If you had a wagon being pulled by a horse, you walked the horse or rode the horse and did not ride in the wagon. If you were part of the upper class, you could ride a horse, uh, hire a hand-carried litter to ride in, and both were commonly done. But to ride in a wheeled vehicle, either as driver or passenger, was a crime punishable, literally, by death. There was only one very notable exception to this law. The emperor, the divine son of heaven, owned a horse-drawn carriage. His palace grounds were large and contained many shrines and gardens with paths gracefully connecting them. The reigning emperor, and only the emperor, could legally ride in this carriage around the garden paths. The carriage was always maroon in color, which is the official imperial color, and was never seen by the public for centuries. This changed in the mid-19th century with the reforms of Emperor Meiji. He rode his carriage on public parade grounds to the amazement of the crowds. They had never seen a passenger vehicle before. Japan at the turn of the 20th century was already quite industrialized and more than capable of developing an automotive industry. However, the law was still on the books. To ride in something with wheels is death. Thankfully, there were those in the Japanese government who were interested in developing a native automotive industry, and so the law was quietly not enforced for some special occasions. The first cars to be built in Japan date from 1902 and were based on contemporary American design. They were primarily experimental, as the idea of actually riding in a car was still way too unacceptable to the Japanese public at large. What changed the official Japanese legal view of cars was the Russo-Japanese War of 1904-1905. through 1905. 
This war was the first time that automobiles were used logistically in battle, and the Japanese generals insisted that the home automotive industry be developed to support army operations. This continued through to and beyond World War I. The Japanese automotive industry built mostly military vehicles and very few private ones. It was not until the 1930s that the overall Japanese population stigma against cars eased and people began to buy and use them in Japan. However, as a reminder of their own history, only the emperor may legally own a maroon-colored car in Japan today, though the current penalty for being caught with one is a fine and loss of the car and no longer death by beheading. Inventing something is hard enough to do on its own, but to have people hating your work and fighting against it can be soul-crushing. Yet, the reason we have cars today is because there will always be those people that, no matter how difficult the fight, will just not give up. They take the abuse and press on until the naysayers can no longer touch them, not even the ones writing the laws. So in a way, these legal obstacles in the way of cars only made the industry stronger and the final victory over the haters that much sweeter. Thanks for watching Vintage Car History and we'll see you next week. Peace.